Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Dr. Ramin Beggy. Dr. Beggy is a cardiothoracic surgeon. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez, for your kind introduction. I'm Ramin Beggy. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon. I have the um, opportunity to talk to you tonight. I will try to make some salient points about what, what is new in cardiothoracic surgery. If there are any questions or, or, or things in my discussion that are not clear, please, by all means, interrupt me. I'll be happy to elaborate further. The general topic of my discussion is minimally invasive techniques in cardiothoracic surgery, but I will try to focus a little bit on this particular area of uh, interest, that, which is the treatment of aortic stenosis uh, without the use of a heart-lung machine, uh, the, the, the technique known as transcatheter aortic valve replacement. I will try to discuss uh, some of those and perhaps it would be of uh, used to, to you ladies and gentlemen and, uh, and to our, our uh, audience and in our community at large. Let's uh, talk a little bit uh, first about aortic stenosis. There is a significant amount of data that shows the aortic stenosis, which is the tightness of the aortic valve, which is the major valve, uh, one of the four valves in your heart, uh, is very prevalent. F about, about approximately six million Americans have uh, various degrees of aortic stenosis. The problem with the aortic stenosis is that kind of akin to someone putting their thumb on, on, a, on a water hose, your heart's squeezing very hard to get the blood out of the heart into your circulation. And if there's an obstruction to the flow, then there is a high velocity uh, of blood that comes across that. So in order for your body to generate enough blood pressure in your body uh, that is uh, sufficient uh, uh, for, your, for your circulation and for your uh, normal life, the heart will have to work extra hard to get the blood across the aortic valve. If somebody does exercises, uh, over, over time their muscles in their arms get bigger and stronger, which is good, but for the heart, the muscle in the heart gets thicker. And as a result, the chamber of the heart where the blood is, it gets smaller. And then people will gradually develop symptoms associated with the aortic stenosis. I will try to discuss some of those uh, problems in, in our conversation today. Just if you look at your heart in general, your heart has uh, four chambers. This chamber on this side of the heart is called the left ventricle. So the oxygenated blood comes to the left atrium. From there, it goes across the mitral valve. And then the chamber of the heart squeezes the blood past the aortic valve. Aorta is the major blood vessel that leaves the heart and brings the oxygenated blood first to the brain, to the arm, and then it goes behind your chest into the descending thoracic aorta and through the rest of your body. So there is a valve that sits between the aorta and the left ventricle. When your heart contracts, the aortic valve opens and the blood comes out. And then when the heart relaxes, the aortic valve closes. So if there's a problem with the tightness of this valve, then it's called the aortic stenosis, that the blood has a hard time coming out. Some people have a problem with the relaxation of the valve. It doesn't completely close. So as a result, blood comes back. And then either your heart is working extra hard because the blood keeps coming back and the heart has to push it out, or the valve is too tight, so the heart is working very hard to push the blood across it. And then as a result, these muscles here get thicker and this chamber gets smaller. So as this muscle thick thickens, the chamber where the blood goes to get pushed out gets smaller. And most of the symptoms are associated with that. So this one shows that how the, when the valve opens up, blood comes back. So if there's a problem with the closure of the valve, then that problem is called aortic insufficiency or aortic regurgitation. Patients could have either problem, either tightness of the aortic valve or stenosis of the aortic valve. If you look at the aortic valve in cross section, um, it kind of it closes and looks like a Mercedes Benz sign. But in, normally most of us are born with three leaflets. These three leaflets of the aortic valve, valve if you splay the aorta open, it looks like that. And then these leaflets come together and form a competent valve. But the, over time, as we get older, 
not all of us, but some of us, the aortic valve gradually becomes tighter. So it used to be very thin and pliable, now it's calcified. So this orifice, you can see, it doesn't completely open up. And sometimes it doesn't completely close either. So you have both a stenotic aortic valve and an incompetent aortic valve. A minority of us, perhaps less than one in a thousand, are born with a valve that has two leaflets instead of three. Those patients in general develop aortic stenosis a little bit sooner, prior, probably prior to the age of 60. So if you get a younger person who has aortic stenosis, it's highly likely they were born with some congenital abnormality of the aortic valve, that the valve was, born, was, uh, was given to them and had two leaflets. And as a result, these valves become tighter a little bit faster, sooner in their lifetime. So what are the uh, risk factors for aortic stenosis? Perhaps anybody over the age of 60, especially if somebody is born with a bileaflet aortic valve, the valves become tight and stenotic. This is the condition that is, uh, you were born with, so it had nothing to do with smoking or cholesterol or uh, lack of exercise or even being overweight. The calcification of the aortic valve is irrespective of those risks. Either you were born with the two leaflets or just over time the valve became calcified and it became tighter over time. It's nothing the patient had done that caused that problem. Some patients for various reasons because of the infection in the tooth or some other infection can develop endocarditis which is in infection of the aortic valve then over time that valve can become damaged either by becoming incompetent or regurgitating or becoming tight. So those are the injuries that happen to the body. High blood pressure may be a risk factor uh, for aortic stenosis, but in general, even people who have normal blood pressure are at risk of developing aortic stenosis over time as we live uh, longer. Then, let's say you, you don't know whether you have aortic stenosis, uh, uh, what should you do? Occasionally, your doctor may hear a murmur during the physical exam, and then he says, you have an abnormal uh, sound, heart sound in, in your chest. You put a stethoscope on your chest, hear some sort of a murmur. There's a very typical murmur associated with the aortic stenosis that you hear uh, some sort of a loud sign as if some water going through a pipe like a whoosh, whoosh, sound like that. Normally you hear it on the right side of the heart. That's a typical murmur of aortic stenosis. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have severe aortic stenosis and you need surgery, but it would be maybe the first clue. But let's say nobody has heard the murmur in someone's chest. What should you be worried about? Because this aortic stenosis uh, happens gradually over time, the symptoms are gradual. So as we all get older, we sometimes we avoid take using a staircase, maybe we don't want to walk very far because we get short of breath. It's very common for us to attribute that to uh, the problem of aging or saying, well, I'm not as strong as I used to be. But it could be because from the aortic stenosis. And the, the change is usually very gradual over a period of decades. And a lot of people have aortic stenosis and they are mild or moderate before they become severe and they have no symptoms at all, except gradually they feel they are more tired, they are short of breath, you know, they, they, their stamina is less. They used to be able to walk two or three miles, now after half a mile they need to wait and rest. You know, gradually they avoid staircases because they know if they take one or two flights of stairs they become short of breath. If the aortic stenosis really becomes very advanced, then people develop three typical symptoms. Some people get lightheaded, that, that, that symptom is called syncope, especially on a warm day if they are dehydrated. The people can faint and become lightheaded and faint. That's called syncope. That's one symptom that aortic stenosis could have. Or you can have chest pain because the heart's really squeezing hard to push the blood out of the heart and it kind of runs itself out of blood. As a result, people develop chest pain. They may think it's coronary artery disease or blockages of the coronary arteries, but it may not be that. It may be just the heart is squeezing so hard that is trying to get the blood across. So that could be the second symptoms. If it progresses for a long, long time, and then gradually the heart changes its shape. Normally it looks like a football, like an American football. It has that kind of a shape. But then as the heart becomes thicker and, be and people develop heart failure, the heart becomes rounder and looks more like a basketball. If one develops heart failure, then the symptoms are more severe. Your, the lungs can fill up with fluid, your legs can become swollen and people can become severely short of breath that they can't even do the regular activities, like minor activity can even fatigue them. But hopefully we'll be able to identify aortic stenosis in its early stages, or at least when it's just mildly symptomatic with maybe some syncope, lightheadedness, or no symptoms at all, or perhaps just a little fatigue and, and shortness of breath. So if, you, if the aortic stenosis is left untreated, 
then people, the natural history of aortic stenosis is that eventually uh, the patients will develop heart failure, meaning that the heart becomes so tired and fatigued that it cannot really pump appropriately. At that time, if you try to treat the aortic stenosis, is a lot riskier. Um, I, will, I will get to that in a few minutes, but the, the treatment of aortic stenosis is very straightforward. It's not a physiologic problem. We don't really have a medication or cure for it. Again, like the, somebody who has their thumb on a, on a, on a, on a hose, the, the best thing is to take your thumb off the hose. So if you mechanically go ahead and change that valve and put a new valve in there, then the heart's happy because there is no obstruction to the flow. In general, uh, our patients do extremely well once that procedure is done. So we better wait till the patients have either mild symptoms or some sort of a symptom to do the operation and the valve is uh, severe. However, not wait too long when the patient is in heart failure. And at that point, we can still operate on the patients, but the risk of the operation is quite a bit higher. So what are the treatment options? Again, because this is a mechanical obstruction of the flow of the heart, the best treatment is a mechanical treatment, meaning that surgically remove the valve and put a new valve in there. Fortunately, in, in 2019 or even started 2012, we have other options other than open heart surgery, putting the patient on a heart lung machine and removing the valve. But the, in general, that valve needs to be taken care of. Uh, not unlike any other valve that you have you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a plumbing system in your house. If there's a problem with the valve and the valve is not working, either it's not closing or it's not opening, you need to get rid of that valve and put a new valve in there. The same with your heart. So it's a little bit of plumbing there. But um, let me in general talk about what has happened to cardiothoracic surgery. The, the picture on, the, on this side shows an, an aorta of a person who has a big tear in the aorta. This is sitting in the sac around the heart. In general, the treatment for this patient would have been to take him to the operating room and open up the chest, put him on a heart-lung machine, cool their body, replace that part, resuspend the aortic valve, reconstruct that, and uh, get him out of there, which great majority of our patients are good candidates for that. But this particular patient was very high risk. We thought that this operation was not going to be uh, acceptable for this patient. So we are able to, through a natural conduit, which is another blood vessel in the groin, bring a stent graft and put it in there and cover that hole. Now that looks like a normal aorta. These are like calcification in this patient's, calcification in this uh, patient's artery. Aorta is completely repaired and is not leaking anymore. And this patient was able to leave the hospital in two days as opposed to staying in the hospital for you know, six weeks or eight weeks because of the bad lungs or bad kidney. If somebody has a very large aneurysm of the aorta, of the ACE in the aorta, we can treat some parts of it surgically and make this thing called an elephant trunk. And you can see this sitting inside an aneurysm, inside the chest, as the first operation. Then we'll come at a second time and put the stent graft in there and hook it up from here down to the descending thoracic aorta. So the second operation doesn't require opening the chest. So this operation can be done, again, less invasively. These patients can go home. If somebody is born uh, uh, with a hole in the middle of their heart, so there is a communication between various chambers of the heart. In the past, we would go and take those patients to the operating room, put them on a heart-lung machine and open the heart and kind of fix this hole and patch it. But now we have a technique that we have this device uh, that looks like a mushroom that we can, through the, through the vein, get across the hole, plug it on one end, plug it on one, the other end, and then basically close the hole without ever opening this patient's uh, uh, chest. We have more or less the same uh, options now for aortic stenosis, that we can do the treatment for the patients that we consider to be high risk for open heart surgery without opening the chest and using the heart-lung machine. So what is the problem again with the aortic valve? We talked a little bit about that. The patients develop thickening uh, and, uh, and tightness of the leaflets of the aortic valve that causes obstruction to the flow from the heart to the rest of the body. If you wait for a long time, they, they gradually develop these symptoms angina, which is chest pain, syncope, which is a, a dizziness and fainting, and congestive heart failure, which is swelling of the legs and the, and the fluid in their lungs. As I mentioned, this natural history of aortic stenosis is very well known. So if you look at the survival of the patients um, over time, the, the line is very flat. So somebody is diagnosed with aortic stenosis in here, they don't have very many symptoms. And, the, and then you can see it's pretty flat. But once they develop these three symptoms that I mentioned, chest pain, lightheadedness, or congestive heart failure, and then the slope changes. The worst one is when they develop congestive heart failure, and the, probably the best symptoms have is the, the chest pain. 
But in general, if you don't operate on these patients, within two years to five years, just half of these patients die. But if you recognize them at that point, or perhaps a little bit sooner and operate on them, then the survival is 98% as opposed to 50% compared to the medical management of the aortic stenosis. So what are the indications for aortic uh, uh, surgery? If the patient has any symptoms, chest pain, those syncope that I mentioned, congestive heart failure, those are really good indication to do the operation. Just the loudness of the murmur by itself is not an indication for surgery. But if you do an echocardiogram and we recognize over time the heart's beginning to thicken up, and then the contractility of the heart, the squeeze of the heart has, has diminished over time, that would be a good time to operate on those patients. Basically, take care of this thing before it gets too late and before the patient develops heart failure. We have some guidelines that your cardiology um, doctors will use and then they interact with the, with the surgeons. If the aortic valve stenosis is really, really tight and the aortic valve area is below a certain number, below one, approaching 0 0.6, even if the patient has no symptoms at all, and in general, we operate on those patients because we know that only bad things can happen. If you have aortic stenosis, you will never get better. It is possible it stays more or less the same, but in all, all likelihood, it will just gradually get worse. So the best thing is to take care of the aortic stenosis before it has become too bad that the risk is too high. So what kind of choices do we have had up to now for aortic valve replacement? We could replace the aortic valve with a mechanical aortic valve that is made out of graphite. Those patients in general will have to take blood thinners for the rest of their life. In general, we have used those valves for the younger patients. We think that maybe it would be more durable for them. But even mechanical valves uh, uh, have problems. Sometimes scar tissue can form and get, go into them and keep them from opening and closing. And they need to be on this medication uh, called warfarin or Coumadin for the rest of their life. And that has problems by itself. Some people are, take too much Coumadin and they can bleed. If you take too little Coumadin, the uh, aortic valve uh, can thrombose. But in general, 99% of the patients will do very well if you replace it and you monitor their valves. And then there are these bioprosthetic valves that kind of more or less mimic the human uh, aortic valve. They are made either from the pericardium of the cow or the leaflets of the pig, and they are mounted on uh, some scaffold, and the surgeons can go in there, take out the aortic valve, and sew that in. That is basically the precursor to the transcatheter aortic valve, that the, the valve that now we can put in someone's aorta without putting them on the heart-lung machine. All of those valves are essentially bioprosthetic. They are not mechanical, because if you can imagine, the valve has to be placed in some sort of a package, placed through a small uh, artery in the groin, and be brought in the vicinity of the aortic valve in the chest, and then the sheath is pulled back, and then the valve is deployed. So it has to be put in in a low profile format and then be put back to the assumes its normal shape. So mechanical valves, we cannot really squeeze them in a small catheters. But the bioprosthetic valves, now we have a technology that we can put them in a small package. Either expand them with the balloon when they are in the aorta, or some of them are made in a particular uh, metal alloy called nitinol that when it comes into contact with the 37 degree Celsius blood, it opens by itself. Homographs are uh, human cadaver uh, grafts that uh, have been prepared in, in advance for people who have a bad infection in the aortic root, and that's, that's the pause problem with the aortic valve. We can replace them with a human homograft, and they are very resistant to infection, and, and they last a long, long time. And also, sometimes the entire area where the valve is involved, where the coronary arteries come, the valve itself, there is some aneurysm around it, then we can actually replace the entire aortic root and reconnect the, the valve. But let's, uh, more or less, let's concentrate on the transcatheter aortic valve because great majority of us who develop aortic stenosis have this calcific aortic stenosis. We are over the age of 60, we develop that problem. So in addition to the bioprosthetic valve that we can put in uh, surgically, we can also use a transcatheter aortic valve or TAVRs. So the valves kind of look like that. This is a mechanical valve. This area here called the sewing ring and the valve opens and closes. So if you look at an echocardiogram, it looks like butterfly wings or bad wings. These are tissue valves that the, the leaflets are made from the pericardium of the cow or, or the leaflets of the pig. And these are kind of like homografts that we can put into the aortic root. Basically the valve that now we are using from a, for a transcatheter aortic valve is very similar to these valves, except for instead of having this rigid uh, 
uh, scaffold around it, has a flexible uh, metal scaffold that it can be squeezed into a small size and then re-expanded later. Also, as the uh, cardiology colleagues uh, and as our other fields have become more invasive, cardiac surgeons have become less and less invasive. So let's say you are a very good risk patient. Even if you are in your 60s, 70s, or 80s, we think your lungs are fine, your kidneys are fine, and you would tolerate the uh, standard operation. We can do your operation through a very small incision in the chest, would be maybe about two to two and a half inches long. So we don't have to open up the entire chest. This way we can expose the aorta, replace the aortic valve and close the chest and you have a small scar. Most of our patients who have no other problems other than the aortic valve can have the operation done this way. However, for the transcatheter aortic valve, we have found out that there, are, there is a natural conduit that will take us from somewhere that is not invasive, like a groin artery, all the way to the aorta and to the uh, aortic valve. So instead of opening a major body cavity like the chest, and opening the aorta and putting the patient on the heart-lung machine, we know through a little stick through the groin, we can get the valve up there and put it in its normal position and then deploy it. That's basically the whole idea of a transcatheter aortic valve. If I could give you an example, let's say there is a problem with the plumbing under your house and is underneath a whole bunch of concrete. One way for you would be to go over there and cut the concrete and get the pipe out and replace it at the same time. But if somehow your plumber tells you, well, you don't have to do this from a, from a faucet, I can put a small wire out there and put something in there to get rid of the leak, that's easier, right? Not, not cutting out the concrete. This is still the same thing. If you don't have to open someone's chest and put them on a heart-lung machine and somehow get to the aortic valve from an area that is less invasive, that's basically the philosophy of a transcatheter aortic valve, which is less invasive and easier for our patients to tolerate. If for some reason the patient has peripheral vascular disease, the arteries in the groin are not very good, when you still need to get to the aortic valve, we can still through a small incision through the aorta itself put a valve inside of it. That technique is already available. Let's say for some reason we don't want to open the chest at all. Is there a way, are there a way we can get to the aortic valve? Yes, because we can also get to the aorta from the tip of the heart without again putting the patient on a heart-lung machine. So we can come from the tip of the heart put the valve inside the aorta and then put it in its right position and ends up in the right spot with a little tiny little hole in the heart. Again, the patient's chest wasn't open, heart-lung machine wasn't used, but somehow we were able to access this uh, area. So what is the uh, benefit of the aortic valve? So they have looked at the uh, patients who um, um, over time required aortic valve replacement. Initially, our experience with the transcatheter aortic valve uh, was the uh, was the blue line. But over time, as we got experience, then our outcome improved. It went from, you know, 50% uh, good outcome in patients to about 80 to 90% outcome in patients. And then if you compare that to the patients who have medical management only, you'll see that the results are significantly improved. So if you have an aortic stenosis, the chance of the patient uh, dying would be 50%. If we do an aortic valve replacement by that period of time, we have an extra 30% advantage that the patients would have died otherwise that would be surviving uh, 36 months uh, later, three years later. So there are advantages to the transcatheter aortic valve, which is the patient's survival in addition to the symptoms. Now you can compare with the initial, initial evaluation what happens with the patients who have a surgical aortic valve versus transcatheter aortic valve. Even though the technology of a transcatheter aortic valve was new, the results were very comparable. Whether you were able to do it with the surgical replacement or the transcatheter aortic valve, the outcome was the same. So then, what is the advantage of a transcatheter aortic valve? Well, the advantage I mentioned, you don't have to open a major body cavity. Some people have lung disease, kidney disease, uh, various other issues that open heart surgery is high risk. But if you manage to operate on those patients without uh, further injury to the lungs, to the kidneys, and be able to go home in two to three days, that's a major advantage. That's what the trial was about. To the patients who are not in general considered to be good surgical candidates, are there any options for them? And the answer was yes. This also shows that um, the mortality of the patients who had a, a aortic valve replacement compared to the a, a transcatheter aortic valve was very comparable uh, over a period of time. The surgical patients in general still did a little bit better because they tended to be a little bit younger and a little bit of a lower risk. But the results even since then have improved. 
The first uh, comparison was between very high risk patients, the patients we considered to be on excessively high risk for surgical aortic valve replacement. Then we did another trial that compared to intermediate risk patients. Now we are doing a trial to compare low risk patients to see if there is this, we can get the same outcome with a less invasive approach as we would have gotten uh, with respect to the aortic valve replacement. So the transcatheter aortic valve is uh, kind of like the Tesla of the aortic valve. It is better technology, it's a little bit slicker, but the same as Tesla has a little bit of a limitation. Maybe you can, cannot drive quite as far uh, on a Tesla as you would on your uh, old-fashioned car. The same thing with the transcatheter aortic valve. Um, for some patients, a patient will develop a little bit of a leak around the aortic valve. If you go there surgically, remove the entire valve and put a new valve in there, the likelihood of that valve being solidly in place is a lot higher than if you try to go through the groin and push the calcified valve to the side and put a valve inside the valve. So the transcatheter aortic valve has a little bit of that limitation. There is a little bit of a higher risk that the patient may require a pacemaker because again, after all, we are pushing the calcium to the side as opposed to just taking it out. So there, there's, a, there's a, some in, increased chance that the patient may require a pacemaker. But on the other hand, there is a lot fewer uh, uh, risk associated with the bleeding, um, hospitalization, remaining on the ventilator, and, 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 and um, um, transfusions, and then um, faster time to recovery. And as I mentioned, the surgical aortic valve outcome has improved significantly. Great majority of our patients, even their octogenarians in their 80s or even people in their 90s, who do very well in the surgical aortic valve replacement. So as that outcome has improved, so has the outcome of a transcatheter aortic valve. So as a result, we have to evaluate our patient to see what would be the best option for them. Is it better to just, yes, do the surgical aortic valve replacement or the TAVR uh, uh, treatment? In summary, Aortic, uh, I'll just go over this thing and maybe read some of it verbatim. The aortic stenosis is uh, very prevalent. As I mentioned, in, uh, anybody over the age of 60 uh, has some risk of having aortic stenosis. Approximately 6 million Americans currently have uh, aortic stenosis and is one of the most common operations. In the past, we would offer uh, a surgical aortic valve replacement only to the lower risk patients. Now, with the, the advent of a transcatheter aortic valve, we can treat our patients who are even at higher risk older age, more frail, and we think the surgery is uh, more risky for them. If the aortic stenosis is uh, asymptomatic, well, we find some early signs that the heart is being strained uh, from, the, from the aortic stenosis. We evaluate those patients and we try to uh, give them an aortic valve replacement. Uh, and if uh, the, the, the degree of aortic stenosis is small and the patients have no symptoms, we can follow those patients closely, maybe with an echocardiogram every, every six months to every three months. And once the degree of stenosis becomes severe, or if the patient develops symptoms, then we'll offer them um, surgery. Transcatheter aortic valve, also known as TAVR, is an excellent alternative to the surgical aortic valve replacement. It does have a little bit of increased risk of stroke and some uh, risk of vascular injuries, but those are basically offset by other risks that are associated with the surgical aortic valve. Right now, the uh, FDA has a strict guidelines for which patients we can be evaluated from trans transcatheter aortic valve. Because after all, for surgical aortic valve, we have some 55 to 60 years of experience, and then and the technique has begot, gotten better. The heart-lung machine has become safer. Evaluation of the patient has become better. But the transcatheter aortic valve has been only around since about 2011. So if you are being considered for transcatheter aortic valve, right now the FDA requires you to be evaluated by at least two surgeons and one cardiologist. There is a society of thoracic surgeon has a risk calculator. We enter all of your data, your age, your kidney function, your renal function, your prior operation, the degree of frailty in that. And then it will give us a risk assessment. What is the risk of operation for this particular patient? And if he happens to be beyond a certain limit, in general, we offer those patients transcatheter aortic valve. Having said that though, that's probably a moving target. As the technology of a transcatheter aortic valve advances, then I'm pretty sure that we'll be offering that to more, more and more people. Perhaps at some point it may become a standard uh, operation only for the patients that we cannot do the transcatheter AOD valve, we offer them a surgical AOD valve. Uh, just briefly to tell you what the procedure is done, if the patient is referred to us for a surgical AOD valve replacement and we consider that patient to be a better candidate for a transcatheter AOD valve, we evaluate the patient, we do various tests including an angiogram of their heart, look at the entire aorta, and then the patient gets accepted for transcatheter aortic valve. When they go to the hybrid operating room, 
there are, there's a surgeon there and a cardiac thoracic surgeon is there with a cardiologist. There's a heart-lung machine available in that uh, operating uh, room. And the patient nowadays most of the time is uh, pretty awake. Uh, the anesthesiologist is there to keep him comfortable. So if an emergency happens, we can take care of the patient then and there. Ninety some percent of the time there is no emergency. The transcatheter aortic valve is done through an artery through the groin. The patient goes to the recovery room and most of the time goes home either the next day or two days from the time of surgery without having to open their chest or any major body cavity. Uh, the investigation for the transcatheter aortic valve for the lower risk patient has continued. I'm pretty optimistic the results will be promising and pretty soon it may become more of a standard the same way that the other procedure I described eventually became standard.